Horror is the most deeply personal genre, by its very definition. While most genres such as fantasy, sci-fi, and romance are all defined by elements within the world of the story, horror is defined by the raw emotion within the viewer. Perhaps the most similar genre in this regard is, oddly enough, comedy. However, while your sense of humor tends to grow with more exposure to comedy, your sense of horror seems to go in the opposite direction. As you experience more horror, things which used to keep you up at night become comfortable. In some ways, this is a natural part of growing up. As you get older, the divide between fact and fiction grows, and the monsters of your childhood are revealed for what they truly are, reflections of your own lack of understanding. As we get older, we recognize that there really aren't monsters hiding in the closet, under the bed, or in the attic. But there's something more that happens in the case of horror enthusiasts. Something I've experienced quite personally, and that I think many of you will be able to relate to. So here, having made many new Halloween memories, I'm feeling retrospective. I want to briefly delve into the fears of the past so that we might learn more about the horrors of the present. It was Halloween, 2011. I had dressed up as the main character from my favorite game at the time, Bastion. It was the most excited I'd been about Halloween in a while, because that year, I was going trick-or-treating with a couple of my best friends. But I wasn't excited about candy or going door-to-door. -door. No, I was excited because I heard that someone in the neighborhood was putting on a haunted house. That sort of thing rarely happens out in the boonies where I'm from, so it was a big deal for 12-year-old Crow. The sun took its sweet time crawling across the orange October sky, but when it finally dipped below the horizon, my friends and I raced across an unfamiliar neighborhood. I never wanted to forget the experience, so I even brought a video camera with me. I planned to record it all, every scare, every monster, every scream immortalized in crystal clear 480p. The three of us rounded the corner, and I might have gotten about 20 feet from the entrance before the excitement in my body catalyzed and transformed into pure dread. I was frozen, not by the cool night's breeze through the dark valley, but by my own terror. What had I gotten myself into? And more importantly, how could I get out of it? <sighs> I couldn't. In the end, my friends basically had to drag me into the house. What's worse, I somehow ended up at the front of the group. As I was ushered into a dark garage, I squeezed my eyes shut, hit record on my camcorder, and allowed myself to be pushed forward by the group. At one point, I dared to take a glance to my left and saw a table covered in latex heads roughly hacked off at the neck. My eyes snapped shut and stayed that way until I stumbled back blindly into the chill of the neighborhood. I was out of the house, but that feeling I experienced, it was so strange. It was a sick, sticky kind of feeling in the pit of my stomach. The sort of feeling that keeps you up at night, tossing and turning for hours, always certain that your next turn will bring you face to face with the object of your terror. It was fear. An awful feeling, to be sure, but I wanted more. Horror had its hooks in me, even if I didn't dare set foot in another haunted house again. Fear followed me from then on. In high school, I was up late one night chatting with a few strangers in an online chat room. Everything was going fine, but midnight struck, the conversation took a turn, and I saw it. I was such a coward in high school that even a simple image like this could throw me off my whole night. Four hours later, I finally managed to fall asleep in a very brightly lit room. Still, there was that feeling again. The drive to find more. Fear became a friend I could rely on in my teenage years when I started to read and listen to creepypastas. I particularly remember The Rake being a story that kept me up at night. Ben Drowned was another one. Even more than the stories, however, the images associated with them clung to me. They became the faces that I envisioned watching me from the foot of my bed. The classic Jeff the Killer image stuck with me for a long time, even if the story didn't. I started to realize just how much fun there was to be had in horror. I read all that I could and even wrote a few stories of my own. However, 
as I got deeper and deeper into the genre, I started to sleep better some nights. And then every night. It seemed like the more I fed my hunger for horror, the more starved I became. That sick, sticky feeling started to abandon me. Those faces lost their home at the foot of my bed. There was no monster in my closet. And I wasn't afraid. There were still things I enjoyed about horror, of course, but the sting was gone. Monsters ceased to be scary. Not really, anyway. Even when I would watch a movie and think to myself, Man, what a scary monster. I really meant something like, That monster is well designed. Or, wow, this really breaks the mold. During this time, I discovered the utter mastery of Junji Ito. Ito's works solidify him as one of the greatest horror authors to have ever lived, and certainly my favorite. His work, in my mind, is everything that horror should be. Every story is a twist on the realm of ordinary experience. His work is ambiguous and only tells you just enough to make the story scary. Most importantly, it's varied. Reading The Long Dream feels totally different from reading Splatter Film or The Hanging Balloons, but all three are disturbing in their own way. Diving into Ito's catalog for the first time felt like an exploration of some untouched sphere of the human mind, and I loved it. I loved it so much that I had to know why I loved it. The world of cosmic horror opened up to me, and I began to analyze the indiscernible, to understand the unthinkable, and to know the unknowable. And that, my friends, was where I hit a wall. Horror is something that I love, so I study it intensely. I try to get as much of it as I can, and I try to figure out what makes some horror work and some horror fall flat. I want to understand why it is that the enigma of Amigara Fault makes my skin crawl, and why Jeff the Killer kind of just makes me laugh. And I know I'm not the only one who does this. There's plenty of discourse online right now surrounding internet and analog horror, and a common sentiment these days is that things have gotten stale. It's not that we're immune to horror. Most horror these days just isn't scary. But what would be scary? I have a sneaking suspicion that next to nothing would fit the bill today. Not for everyone, anyway. No new trend is going to come along and revitalize that old sense of dread within us, because the issue isn't with horror. The issue is with us. Thousands of new viewers find out about analog horror every single day. I know because I hear from you guys in my comments. The horror of today is still giving new viewers and new audiences that same feeling that we used to get. It's just not doing it for us anymore. That's not to say that every piece of horror media is perfect or scary or even good, but what I am saying is that some of us have traded fear for understanding without ever recognizing that such a transaction was taking place. Now, I could sit here and try to explain this to you in detail, but I think it'd be a lot better if I let a more experienced writer than myself explain it to you. Now, when I had mastered the language of this water and come to know every trifling feature that bordered the great river as familiarly as I knew the letters of the alphabet, I had made a valuable acquisition, but I had lost something, too. I had lost something which could never be restored to me as long as I lived. All the grace, the beauty, the poetry had gone out of the majestic river. I still kept in mind a certain wonderful sunset which I witnessed when steamboating was new to me. A broad expanse of the river was turned to blood. In the middle distance, the red hue brightened into gold, through which a solitary log came floating, black and conspicuous. In one place, a long, slanting mark lay sparkling upon the water. In another, the surface was broken by boiling, tumbling rings that were as many tinted as an opal. Where the ruddy flush was faintest was a smooth spot that was covered with graceful circles and radiating lines ever so delicately traced. The shore on our left was densely wooded, and the somber shadow that fell from this forest was broken in one place by a long, ruffled trail that shone like silver. And high above the forest wall, 
A clean-stemmed dead tree waved a single leafy bough that glowed like a flame in the unobstructed splendor that was flowing from the sun. There were graceful curves, reflected images, woody heights, soft distances, and over the whole scene, far and near, the dissolving lights drifted steadily, enriching it every passing moment with new marvels of coloring. I stood like one bewitched. I drank it in, in speechless rapture. The world was new to me, and I had never seen anything like this at home. But as I said, a day came when I began to cease from noting the glories and the charms which the moon and the sun and the twilight wrought upon the river's face. Another day came when I ceased altogether to note them. Then, if that sunset scene had been repeated, I should have looked upon it without rapture. I should have commented upon it inwardly after this fashion. The sun means that we're going to have a wind tomorrow. That floating log means the river's rising, small thanks to it. The slanting mark on the water refers to a bluff reef which is going to kill somebody's steamboat one of these nights, if it keeps on stretching out like that. Those tumbling boils show a dissolving bar and a changing channel there. The lines and circles in the slick water over yonder are a warning that the troublesome place is shoaling up dangerously. That silver streak in the shadow of the forest is the break from a new snag, and he's located himself in the very best place he could have found to fish for steamboats. That tall dead tree with a single living branch. It's not going to last long, and then how's anybody supposed to get through this blind place at night without that friendly old landmark? No, the romance and beauty were all gone from the river. All the value any feature of it had for me now was the amount of usefulness it could furnish towards compassing the safe piloting of a steamboat. Since those days, I've pitied doctors from my heart. What does the lovely flush on a beauty's cheek mean to a doctor but a break that ripples above some deadly disease? Are not all her visible charms so thick with what are, to him, the signs and symbols of hidden decay? Does he ever see her beauty at all? Or doesn't he simply view her professionally and comment upon her unwholesome condition all to himself? And doesn't he sometimes wonder whether he's gained most or lost most by learning his trade? This is the same position that many of us find ourselves in. All the poetry and horror has been replaced by sheer practical understanding an analytical abstraction of what's really scary. A picture of what horror should be. Of course, I'm just some dummy online, not an actual master of horror, but I didn't need to develop true mastery over the genre to get to this point. Just an attitude of mastery towards horror. I took my fear and I put it in a box. Once, I only cared about the feeling that horror gave me, but over time I carved out a particular criteria for judging horror to be good or condemning it as bad. I prioritized mastery over madness and that sick, sticky feeling that I spent so long chasing. I had accidentally chased it out of fiction entirely. I don't regret it. As I said, my love for horror has never been deeper, but it's hard not to mourn a little for that feeling that I may not ever get back. Of course, there's still the nagging voice in the back of my head, which says that fear isn't something so small I could ever box it up. Life is full, full of unknowns. To box up one's fear means to box up the whole world. To seal off the sun and the stars, to snuff out existence itself. I'm not so bold as to believe that sort of power rests in my hands. After all, am I not that same scared child who was afraid to step into that garage 12 years ago? Of course I am. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that I had brought a camcorder with me into that house. Thinking back, I only rewatched the video once. That was enough to tell that the footage was pretty much unusable. I had mostly recorded the floor and the walls nothing interesting, and I had totally failed to capture the true nature of that experience. But despite that, here I am, 12 years later, 
and I can remember every single second. I never did forget it. How could I? And this Halloween, I took the plunge once again. I cracked the top off my box of fears, and I did something that I had been dreading since 2011. A haunted house. It wasn't particularly extreme. Anyone with a modest experience of haunted houses wouldn't even be phased. But getting chased through a maze by a dozen men in spirit Halloween masks was... It was special to say the least. It was overwhelming. It was at times hilarious. But most importantly, it was the most afraid that I have been in years. I'm Crumudgeon. Thanks for watching. <laughs>